what is going on everybody how is everybody doing today welcome back here today to another episode of the just ball and podcast and today we are going to continue our positional rankings and today we're going to be doing our top 30 shooting guards for the 2025 nba season now for the last podcast i don't know if i clarified this but this is basically me predicting how next year's season is going to go for that point guard um episode i did have like emmanuel quickly 16 i had damian Moore 10 i had harden i think 17 in that as well and that's because i'm thinking there could be a little bit regression from those guys and i'm expecting a big breakout year for emmanuel quickly um it's just basically what i'm projecting next year not off of last year i'm going to take into account like what happened over the last couple of years the way that their careers have been going but this isn't basically um, me just predicting what happened um, last year. This is me predicting what's going to happen next year and taking into account historical stuff, future stuff, and what I think is going to be going from there. Now, shooting guards, this is kind of tough. I already made a mistake in my Saras video. I forgot to include Austin Reeves. Great job by me. I'm, I'm an idiot. I do this kind of once a year. Um, I just, when I was making that, I, in my mind, mixed up him and D'Lo, and I thought I already included Austin Reeves in the point guard video, but I had D'Lo in the point guard video, and I mixed them up. So that's on me. Hands up on me. I'm going to include Austin Reeves for this um, that we're going to talk about today. But yeah, I I'm excited to break this down. This is tough. Uh, there's going to be some shooting guards that will not be mentioned in a sense because i'm gonna go off what i think is gonna look like next year that at least we can know of right now now the phoenix sun signed tyus jones which makes me think they're gonna run out a lineup of jones booker beal and then probably katie at the four nurkic at the five um maybe jones comes off the bench and that could definitely happen but for these rankings i'm gonna have beal as a small forward i know beal's never really played the small forward position before but that's what i think he's gonna play majority of his minutes next year so i'm gonna have beal in the small forwards we have Jalen Brown in the small forwards as well. He's been a shooting guard last year, though he was more of a small forward. And now that we're going to include Derek White today, we will have Jalen Brown as a small forward. Um, I'm also going to not include um, OG Ananobi or Mikel Bridges. I can't really predict what they're going to do right now, the Knicks, how they're going to run their lineups out there. I wouldn't even be shocked if we see some small ball lineups with Julius Randle at the five, and then maybe OG could be bumped down to the four. But if I had to guess if Mitchell Robinson and Randle are in that front court, it's going to be Bridges at the two um, and OG at the three. But for these rankings, I'm just going to rank OG and Bridges in my small forward rankings because there's not a lot of small forwards anymore. So I feel like uh, at least at the top. So I kind of want to get as many good guys as I can. And then for Clay Thompson, he played small forward last year for the Warriors. I do think he's going to be more of a small forward next year with Kyrie as the two. He will be in this ranking. And then Luka at the one. So those are some guys that aren't going to be mentioned today. Also like Lou Dort, he'll be in the small forward. I got some comments about that. And yeah, for this bottom, just basically going to break it down. If you guys are on YouTube, you want to let me know what you agree with or disagree with. That's perfectly fine by me. Shooting guards were tough, man. These are tough to really kind of find out what you value more. Do you value the scoring upside of like an Anthony Simons that may not contribute on both ends of the floor? Maybe the playmaking could be a little bit better as well. Or do you prefer somebody like a Dante DiVincenzo who's not going to be able to lead you as a number one option, not a number two, maybe not even a number three, even though he kind of had to do that sometimes for the Knicks in the playoffs. But he's going to get offensive rebounds. He's going to get defense of rebounds he's going to be able to guard other teams best defenders on the perimeter he's very quick he's a great off ball player he can cut he can run in transition he could just do a little bit of everything besides maybe rely on him to create his own shot and not shoot a 30 foot three ball when it matters a lot so it's really kind of what you value most in a shooting guard that's why i think everybody's rankings could be a little bit different so some honorable mentions that i did have uh off this were dyson daniels um dyson daniels also um I don't know, man. He was good for Team Australia. The defensive potential was there. I just don't know if we're going to see an offensive jump next year to warn a top 30 spot. So he just missed out on it. Buddy Heal just missed out on it as well. Um, good shooter, basically. Um, but that's it. How is he going to look in Golden State replacing Steph Curry? Or, well, uh, replacing Klay Thompson. I think he's going to be just fine. But uh, not a great defender. Not really much outside of a spot-up shooter. Keon Ellis, great defender for the Kings last year at the shooting guard position. Uh, he's kind of like their third shooting guard um, as well. If you... what. Uh, I guess whatever Devin Carter ends up being, but obviously Malik Monk is the starter. We'll talk about him in this. And then I also have Gary Trent Jr., who is number 30, um, but he also bumps down a little bit. Also, Bogdan Bogdanovich could be bumped down um, here in the honorable mention. I didn't mention him in my honorable mentions, but I should have in the video. Um, he was in the news for that Serbia game where he ended up giving uh, the three sign after made three to Melo um, on the dome. And... <laughs> Melo well, was sitting courtside, and then Serbia actually blew a, I think they were up by like 15 at one point. So those are the honorable mentions. Dyson Daniels, Buddy Heald, Keon Ellis, Gary Trent Jr., and Bogdan Bogdanovich. And then guys like Jalen Brown, Bradley Beal, Mikel Bridges, OJ Nanobi, and Clay Thompson will be in the small forward episode. 
Well, let's get into this. And I hope I sound good on this. This is kind of like a makeshift setup. I'm currently dog watching right now, so I'm not at my office. So yeah, I think this is gonna sound fine, but it's gonna be a little bit of a different backdrop if you guys are watching on YouTube. And I'm gonna have also plans coming out for the this upcoming NBA season, which I'm really excited about to have on this channel. So uh, we'll kick things off with Jordan Clarkson at number 30. Jordan Clarkson is kind of in that tier of guys that we'll get into um, at also 29. There'll be a couple guys mentioned in this video. Honestly, you can make the same arguments for Clarkson that you can make for Gary Trent Jr. or Bogdan Bogdanovich. These guys are hot and cold. I ISO scores or spot up shooters that are really in a specialist role and that's pretty much what do you want that in a shooting guard I don't think at any point in the season game is on the line I'm really trusting Jordan Clarkson Gary Trent Jr. or Bogdan Bogdanovich, Bogdan Bogdanovich excuse me with a three now sometimes I will trust them for sure there's games where they're going to shoot in the high 50% from the field high 40s from three and they are on but when they're not on they're going to be kind of liabilities on the defensive end of the floor they're not going to play make at a great level they're going to maybe just chill in the corner and it's like do you value that they're not going to crash the offensive glass. I think there could be issues with that, but Jordan Clarkson is still a really good scorer in this week. I would love him as my sixth or seventh man on a contending team. The thing is, in Utah, he's been a top three scoring option, sometimes the number one scoring option if there's no Valerie Markinen out there. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, Clarkson's going to come in at number 30 for me this year. I think we could see his production drop a little bit. Also, wouldn't be surprised if he's not a Utah Jazz by the end of the year, but when you add in all these rookies, um, Colin Sexton, who we'll get into later in this because I do think Sexton is better, I just think the role for Clarkson Clarkson's going to diminish, and then maybe he's going to become more valuable, right? Like, I'd rather Clarkson maybe take 75% um, of his shots that he did last year, this upcoming year, and I think he could be a little bit more efficient on a uh, diminished role and lesser volume. So, I'm going to have Jordan Clarkson come in at number 30. Number 29, I got Norman Powell of the LA Clippers. I do think this could also be a big year for Norman Powell as well, because uh, Norman Powell has been pretty much the third, fourth scoring option with Paul George and Harden and Kawhi there. Now that there's no more Paul George, and if there's one injury to Kawhi or Harden, he's sliding in as the number two scoring option, something we haven't seen in maybe two years. And Norman Powell is just as efficient as most of these guys on this list. He turned into an absolute elite three-point shooter last year, and at some point was in the sixth man of the year conversation. Him and Russ there in Los Angeles, they had a nice two-man game off the bench. I think he's got a nice basketball IQ for somebody in the half court. Uh, it helps he's been playing with veterans. He's been in some winning environments before, not really in Portland, uh, maybe a little bit in, in Toronto, but I, I think Norman Powell is a really good shooting guard that you would want on your team. I, I think he's a top 30 shooting guard. I'm fine if he's my starting shooting guard. If I'm a contending team, though, I'd like for him to be the worst defender out there. If there's somebody worse than him, then we have an issue. Um, and I'm cool with him being my fourth scoring option. And I think that's what the Clippers were kind of building at one point, having this secondary guy that you can rely on off the bench, or maybe if something's not going, or if there's an injury to one of your stars, then I think you can default to Norman Powell, somebody like him, to try to create his own shot in the half court, um, but really kind of can turn into more of a spot-up shooter role. And I think there could be some really fun two-man games with him and James Harden next year. I think James Harden should be able to get a ton of assists and get Norman Powell involved. And I think Norman Powell is better than Jordan Clarkson and is better than all those honorable mentions. So he's coming in at number 29. Number 28, a uh, little disappointing to have him here because I was so high on him in my 2022 draft rankings. Jaden Ivey, um, I I whiffed on that class, man. I had Ivey ranked higher than Paolo Bancaro. Yeah, I'm not happy with that. Uh, we had to go back to the drawing board, and I, I showed my point guard bias in, in that uh, tiers that year. I mean, I did have them in the same tier. I had Chet Holmgren as my number one guy, and then I had I had the four guys in the top t uh, number one tier. I had Chet one. I had, I believe, Ivy two. Mm, did I have Ivy? Okay, now I'm mixing it up. But I think I had Ivy two, Paolo three, Jabari Smith Jr. four, um, which, yeah, not really happy about that whatsoever because Paolo is clearly a top two guy in that class. I mean, if I was a genius, I would have had Jalen Williams in my top five, but I didn't have that. So we're going to have Jaden Ivy here at 28. Now I'm going to give Jaden Ivy the benefit of the doubt. And if he was the 28th ranked shooting guard this year, I actually wouldn't hate that if he's just a little bit more efficient, right? Because like he's been someone that's been really inconsistent with the shot, inconsistent at finishing at the rim, inconsistent defense. I feel like it's just on, off, on, off, like hot and cold, hot and cold. And Monty Williams did not help him at all with that. Monty Williams chose to play Killian Hayes last year throughout the start of the year. More minutes um, and start him and play him over Jaden Ivey. That was just malpractice. And that should be a reason enough that he got fired last year. So I'm hoping J.B. Bickerstaff is better for Jaden Ivey's development. Obviously, he's got to rely or he's got to focus on Cade's development, Duran, Holland, Sore Thompson, a lot of guys' development there. So I hope Ivey isn't, be, uh, isn't put to the side. But at least if he could develop as a good perimeter defender, I'm okay with him shooting 44% from the field, 33% from three. You know, I would be disappointed if that happened, but I would be okay with it if he's going to be a plus defensive player on that side of the floor. So, Ivy's coming in at number 28. 
I'm sad to say that because I had such high hopes for Ivy coming out of Purdue. But hopefully this year is going to be a step in the right direction. And he isn't pushed to the side, at least in that backcourt with Kate Cunningham. Next up at 27, I have Reed Shepard of the Houston Rockets. I'm not sure, but he could be the only rookie I have in the top 30. Now, I haven't broken down my small forward rankings yet. I don't think I'm going to have Modest there. I don't know if I'm going to have somebody like... Dalton connect. Yeah, I don't know. I got to break them down still, but Reed Shepard could be the highest rookie out of anybody here. Reed Shepard looked like a seasoned vet in the summer league. I had him as my third ranked prospect for this draft. I feel like that was too, too well, man. I, I really should just put uh, it out there that he was my top guy. I mean, I flirted with it at one point, but I'm like, you know what, Matt? He could be undersized a little bit. He could be a bad defender, um, but I don't think he will. You know what? I, I think Sar is still going to be really good, and I still think Ron Holland's going to be really good. The two guys I had ahead of him, but Shepard looked phenomenal in the summer league. This dude could really play. 30 minutes a night for Rockets team that is contending for the playoffs next year will he probably not I mean I have another shooting guard in this ranking that's close to the top 10 that he's got a leapfrog minutes for I mean maybe Shepard's a point guard maybe he's playing some three this year I don't know the Rockets could get weird uh because I I don't I have a men Thompson as a small forward because that's what he played majority last year and I have no idea what they're doing this year um with the the rookie minutes so yeah you'll see you'll probably see dylan brooks and men thompson and cam whitmore all in the small forward rankings but Shepard is going to be at the minimum a really efficient shooter for them and he's going to be someone that could spot up he can i think run the second unit at a really high level i mean him and men thompson in the backcourt i think is going to be a lot of fun i think Shepard is going to be a plus defender as a rookie and honestly i would not be surprised if he's a top 20 shooting guard this year as a rookie yeah i'm really high on reed Shepard. 27 may be too low but i had a bump him down a little bit because there could be a lack of playing time or just not enough run for him um, with a crowded young Rockets team and then obviously a lot of guys there on the perimeter. I have Ida Sinmu of the Chicago Bulls coming in at number 26. Big fan of Ayo Man. Loved him at Illinois. I'm glad he's carved out a role in the NBA. Him as a second round pick has really worked out. I believe him I believe him, Miles McBride, and Herb Jones were like three, um, were like one pick apart of each other. I think, I think if I'm remembering correctly, McBride and Dasunmu could have been back to back and then you possibly had Herb Jones like one pick later now uh, it's gonna be in my head but I just assume we signed a really nice contract extension um with the Chicago Bulls and I think they've done a great job developing him and actually giving him some runtime last year with Kobe White and I know Kobe White was the standout but I would assume it was an elite three-point shooter he was an elite spot-up shooter elite catch-and-shoot guy this guy is going to be in the future plans for Chicago for a long long time and I think at, I don't know if he's going to be a starter for years to come but he could be a perfect six man for Chicago if they develop a Kobe White and Josh Giddy backcourt now going back to the second round thing it was Herb Jones at 35 Miles McBride at 36 so they were the ones right up against each other then it was JT Thor shout out South Sudan at 37 and then I would assume it was at 38 that 2021 second round had some nice picks in it as well. You had Aaron Wiggins at 55. You had Jericho Sims at 58. Delano Banton at 46. Brand, man, Brandon Boston really didn't work out, but he was in that as well. Um, you had Jeremiah Robinson Earl. Jason Preston, well, I liked him a ton of coming out of Ohio. All right, all right, we're getting off track here, but I just assume who I think is going to be a top 30 shooting guard next year. I think he's going to come in. Uh, he's coming in at number 26. Um, there's going to be, I think, limitations on what he could be as a ceiling raiser, um, as a defender out there. I think there's going to be not really enough playmaking that we're going to see. Um, like, he's not as good of a playmaker as even some of the guys behind him, like Reed Shepard, like Jaden Ivey, and maybe even some of the guys ahead of him, like Josh Giddy, because I have no idea where he's going to play next year, or a Brandon Pozemski. Um, So, yeah, I do have Ida Sinmu coming in at number 26. Coming in at number 25, I do have the guy that was the holdup in Lowry Market and Warriors Trade Talks, and it's Brandon Pozemski. I am so high on Brandon Pozemski as a player. I think in three years from now, if I'm still making these rankings, I think he's going to be a top 15, top 10 shooting guard in this league unanimously, like, undoubtedly, but I I do think there's going to still be some growing pains. I wonder how consistent his shot is going to look in year two. We've seen players of his caliber maybe flatline in year number two or maybe take a little bit of a step back with his outside shot. So I do worry about that. And he's going to be asked to have a larger role there with Klay Thompson no longer being there in Golden State. They view him as not the successor to Steph Curry, but the guard of the future. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on Brandon Brzezemski this year. And I think he's going to live up to it. I think he's still going to improve on the defensive end of the floor. He's going to be a really good playmaker, better playmaker than almost everybody that we've talked about so far. Um, he's going to crash the glass. I like him on the on the rebounding end more than pretty much anybody here that we've talked about. And I think he's just one of those do-it-all guys. I think if his peak is Dante DiVincenzo was last year for the Knicks, I think you're still okay with that in Golden State. That's a really good player, and that's a really good complimentary piece. And I think he's going to show strides towards that in year number two. At number 24, I have Josh Giddy. Now, I did Kobe White in my point guard rankings. Not really sure where Giddy's going to play next year. I I like would like to think it's going to be the point guard position, and they may switch 
swap Kobe White to the two um, and run that backcourt with Giddy initiating the offense and White could be a little bit more as an off-ball guy. But Giddy played shooting guard last year for the Oklahoma City Thunder, so I'm just going to rank him here as a shooting guard. Um, but yeah, Josh Giddy, I mean, there's obviously limitations to his game, and we saw those on full display in the playoffs. Somebody that was not uh, like a plus on the defensive end of the floor. Teams were leaving him wide open. And in a playoffs game where the intensity is up a notch, you don't really trust them attacking the rim as much as you would maybe in the regular season. Um, I still think Giddy's a really good player. I think he's got really good ball skills, really good court vision. Um, and I think he's someone that's going to be a floor raiser for the Chicago Bulls team. I think he's perfect for this team to help the development of Desunmu, White, Buzelis, Patrick Williams, and whoever else comes and goes. Um, that's a young piece there in Chicago. Even Jalen Smith this year. I'm excited for Josh Giddy and Jalen Smith. I think that could be a really underrated two-man game this year. Um, and he's not going to be a ceiling raiser. He's not going to win you a finals he's not going to carry this team to the playoffs but i do think he can make everybody around him better and i have him coming in at number 24 coming in at number 23 i have colin sexton of the utah jazz i feel like sexton kind of an underrated player in this league this dude is very efficient out there he's got a nice step back jumper he's a very efficient three-point shooter good at attacking the rim can finish strong at the rim for somebody of his size as well and i really like the way that he's adapted and really um i guess become the identity of this role as you know what i'm not a lead initiator i'm not this pass first playmaking point guard that I was at Alabama or maybe scouts thought I would be in Cleveland he's really developed into this off ball secondary shot creator role and I think has been the second best player on the Utah Jazz since he's been traded there with Bowie Marketing, who's obviously the best guy I think he's been better than Jordan Clarkson over the last two years and he was not really a throw in in that in that Donovan Mitchell deal but he was like yeah we'll take a flyer on on Sexton I mean they liked him enough to take on the extension and he has I think been worth every penny and they could get a nice I think return for him at the trade deadline if they moved on from him. But I'm a big fan of Colin Sexton, and 23 may be too low at the end of the year. Coming in at number 22, I have Alex Caruso of the Oklahoma City Thunder. I think he will definitely be the shooting guard for them next year. I could see him starting in that backcourt with Shea, and then you still... Uh, I don't know, though, because... They're, they're paying hard shot a lot of money to what come off the bench i don't know about that so maybe caruso will come off the bench at least to start the year but he is arguably the best defender on this list i mean there's a tier one of defending shooting guards that we'll talk about uh he's one of them uh we'll obviously get into jalen suggs and Derek white um marcus smart that we'll talk about as well but yeah alex caruso is as good as you can get as a defensive point of attack guy out there on the perimeter somebody that's going to go up to the ball right at the point of attack and he and it's going to be tough for the point guard to get around him it's going to be tough for the point guard to make that pass that they're trying to do in their certain set and he's someone that is just going to be another floor raiser for you out there he's actually been a good offensive player as well he actually kind of has a little bit of a clutch gene to him he can hit some threes he's like uh, uh he's aggressive at getting to the rim he can finish at the rim he can make a pass or two can rebound you know what? caruso could do a little bit of everything i would like for him to be a little bit more of like a flamethrower shooter i don't know that's asking a lot but if he was kind of like dante divincenzo oh my god he would be a perfect role player and i do think he I don't know. I, I feel like we could see Derek White potential in him, and I don't know if that's going to be unlocked in Oklahoma City. And it's like Caruso in Chicago was Derek White in San Antonio. Probably not. But I, I, because Caruso is like 30 years old, so I don't know if we're going to see another week from him in what Derek White was directed in 2017. So yeah, I, I think we're going to see. Uh, I mean, Derek White could be 30 for all I know, and I'm just messing this up. But I, I think Caruso is coming in at number 22, and he's in these like the tier of defensive first shooting guards. And it just really comes down to what you value. I should have lumped him in in those defensive guards, but I have KCP coming in at number 21. Maybe not as elite on the perimeter as you would like, maybe a Derek White or Smart or Caruso, but he's right up there. I think him and Suggs are, are similar. I mean, Suggs is definitely better, but I, I do think KCP, um, it was a really good defender last year. Uh, he's someone that's been a good defender in big time moments for the Denver Nuggets. We're going to see that go over to Orlando, where I'm not sure if he's going to have more pressure or less pressure out there now that like he's going from Jokic and Murray and Porter and, and Gordon to a team contending for the finals the last couple of years to a team which is still fairly young, that was kind of playing with house money last year. But I think the Magic uh, I think the Magic would be pretty disappointed if they were around one exit. I think they'd like to win a playoff series next year. I don't think it should be the end of the world, especially if it's a competitive round one exit like it was this year because it's still a, a young team and um, they have a little bit to go. But Franz and Paolo is what you were trying to build there in Orlando. But for KCP, I think he's just going to probably have, I think, even maybe a diminished role in in Orlando, going to be a good spot-up shooter. You're really going to be asking him. Like, you're trying to replicate maybe what Boston is doing with Holiday and White with 
with KCP and Jalen Suggs in Orlando. Not as good, but I think can be. Um, I mean, KCP is getting up there in age. I don't know how many good years he has left. It may be two out of the three years on this three-year contract that he signed, but he's going to be a plus three-point shooter, going to be a plus defender, coming in at number 21. Coming in at number 20, I have Austin Reeves of the LA Lakers. This is probably where I should have had him originally. I do think Reeves has the potential to be in the top 10 um, after the 2023 season. I pretty sure I projected him to be very high and uh, he did not live up I think to that uh, those expectations last year maybe wasn't as confident as aggressive as I would have liked him to be maybe not emerging as that third scoring option because that was kind of like D'Lo it was Hashimura for a stretch and it was Reeves at times but it wasn't as consistent as I thought it would be after we watched him ball out against the Denver Nuggets in the 23 conference finals so I think Reeves I would just like for him to be a little bit more aggressive we may not see him to get more opportunities until they move on from like a D'Angelo Russell or maybe free up some uh, minutes it's in shots there so uh, I think that uh, yeah I, I think Reeves would be around this range of 20 I think he could go up to like I said 10 I think he's probably better than everybody I mentioned um, but like I said I'll, I'll keep being repetitive it, it pretty much what you matters in your shooting guard so if you like like point of attack defense and you can get some shooting here and there then you probably have KCP and Caruso higher than Reeves but if you also like shot creating ability and being a secondary scorer and an elite three-point shooter then you may like Reeves a little bit more than those guys as well. So it's pretty much what your preference is. And I'm going with Reeves over KCP and Caruso. Coming in at number 19, I have Anthony Simons. Mentioned him earlier, and he is somebody that's very tough to rank. I do not think he's a ceiling raiser. Uh, we... I think need to get this year, like, I think under a microscope because he could be an empty stats guy. He could be good stats, bad team, um, and he's going to put up good numbers, but he's not really going to make your team better. He's not going to hit clutch shots maybe when they matter the most to win you a game. Is he going to, yeah, win the Trailblazers a couple games? Is he going to lock in on the defensive end of the floor? Is he going to be a good facilitator? Um, I think those are all questions that you can definitely propose to Anthony Simon, who I think has exceeded his expectations from his draft stock back in uh, 2018, where he was a late first round pick by the Blazers out of IMG Academy. Like, I think Amphrey Simons has been more than, like, exceeded expectations throughout his career, more than what anybody could have thought. But it's like, does he want to elevate himself into a, near a new tier? Does he want to be a top 10 shooting guard this year? Um, and even if the Blazers are a bad team, that's fine. I would just still like to see him maybe improve on the defensive end of the floor, even if he's going to average three to four less points per game. I'd rather Amphrey Simons average 18 to 19 points per game and be a good defender than average 23 points, 24 points, but be bad defender, right? Like, I'd rather have the two-way play in Simons where you can plug and play him on any championship team, and he's going to be very valuable, but he could just be another one of these guys that could be somebody like a Brandon Ingram who we're seeing kind of struggle to get that extension um, that he really wants out there. So, big questions for Simons this year. 18, I have CJ McCollum. Uh, this player, <laughs> I mentioned in the video uh, in the Soros channel, he pisses me off, man. I thought... Like, I am waiting for those big moments for McCollum in the playoffs, and I just feel like we've never really gotten them. I mean, like, he played well at times against the Nuggets back in the conference semifinals against the Nuggets in the 2019 season, but I feel like there was it was the game one or game two against the Thunder where he missed that, like, go-ahead three or game time three, and it's just like, I feel like that's just been the story of McCollum's career. It just doesn't show up in these big moments, which is fine, and that's what he is, but I just don't think I could put him any higher than 18. He's going to get his teammates involved. He's still going to be able to get um, his threes and be a plus shooter out there. Not a great defender, but I I'm excited for him to go kind of go back into a shooting guard this year. I had him in the point guard video. Uh, originally, but I'm like, you know what? It's going to be Murray at the one, McCollum at the two. Uh, so I, I'm excited to see McCollum be more of a shooting guard again. Coming in at number 17, I think could also be similar to what I said about Anthony Simons, and that's Cam Thomas. Cam Thomas may average 25 points per game this year, but if I'm not going to see him, I mean, the Nets are not going to win many games, but if I'm not seeing him improve on the defensive end of the floor, improving as a playmaker, showing that he doesn't need to take X amount of shots of like whatever it is more next year. If his efficiency is going to drop, I don't want to see Cam Thomas shoot 44% from the field, 34% from three. I want to see Cam Thomas shoot 47% from the field um, and 38% from three. Even if that means he's going to average 18, 19 points per game. I don't want to see him put up 24 points on bad efficiency. That's not really going to do much for me, but I do think Cam Thomas is going to be a plus offensive player for a really bad team next year. Um, and I'm, I'm intrigued what that contract extension is going to look like. 16, we're going to stay in the state of New York. I have Dante DiVincenzo. I like these type of shooting guards, man. I like someone that's going to still be a really good offensive player when you need him to be. When Ananobi was hurt, uh, when um, Julius Randle was hurt, he stepped up offensively in the regular season. Now, he had a blip in like outside of that big shot he hit against the Sixers in game number two. He struggled in the playoffs. He was very inconsistent, but he had some really good games. And like I said, we'll step up. There was a Pacer game where he hit like, I feel like it was like seven threes, eight threes. It, it might've been that game three loss. Um, but DiVincenzo is going to come up on the offensive end of the four. He's going to crash the offensive glass. Like we know Josh Hart hustle. 
It's kind of the same with Dante DiVincenzo. He's going to run up and down the floor. He's going to give it 120%. And if I'm building a championship team, I want Dante DiVincenzo in my shooting guard spot more than I want Cam Thomas or Anthony Simons. That's just what I prefer in a shooting guard. Um, I do think there's offensive limitations with KCP in his age that I think could take a step back. And Alex Caruso is just what we've seen throughout his career um, that I have them a little bit lower because I do think Dante DiVincenzo, if he wanted to, could be a 20 point per game score, but he doesn't need to be. And I don't know if KCP and Caruso have that, but obviously they're better on the defensive end of the floor. But I think there's a larger gap between DiVincenzo's offensive game and KCP's and Caruso's than the reverse of KCP and Caruso's defense to DiVincenzo's defense. So that's why I'm high on him coming in at 16. Coming in at number 15, I have Marcus Smart of the Memphis Grizzlies. Let's not forget about Marcus Smart. He didn't play too much last year. He was hurt at times uh, for the Memphis Grizzlies. That whole team was hurt, but it was two years ago where Marcus Smart ended up winning Defensive Player of the Year. Last year, he appeared in 20 games, 14 and a half points, three rebounds, four and a half assists. Uh, he did shoot 31% from three. Now, there's going to be some like hero ball, no, 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 yes, like shots from Marcus Smart. Like, what are you doing? Um, but I think he's going to be in a win now mindset he just watched his former team win the nba finals he's still going to be an elite defender i don't know if he's going to be an all defensive defender next year because marcus smart is now 30 years old it's making me feel old <laughs> um but yeah i think smart is going to be a good defender plus three-point shooter, and be arguably one of the better 3D players in this league in 2025. Coming in at number 14, I have Devin Vassell, and a lot of you guys, like, I had him, like, 14, and I think a lot of people were like, man, that's kind of high, but I think Devin Vassell, uh, we thought he was going to break out last year. He kind of did. I mean, his numbers did go up across the board. Um, he went from 18.5 points per game in year three to 19.5 in year four, 43% from the field to 47% from the field, 38% from three to 37% from three. Like, I will take those numbers, and he was a good free throw shooter. The shot looks great. You're going to add in even more gravity towards Wemby. Teams are going to be double teaming him almost every time in the post, it feels like. You're adding in one of the best facilitators and point guards of all time, Chris Paul, to get him the rock. Yeah, I, I love Devin Vassell to be the second leading scorer on this team. Even Jeremy Shohan, who's going to have a big role, is going to pass the ball and is going to facilitate. So I think Vassell could fully break out as a legit number two option to San Antonio, be better than Keldon Johnson, and be someone that you could build around as a secondary guy to Wemby going forward. Coming in at number 13, I have RJ Barrett of the Toronto Raptors. RJ did play well for Team Canada in a disappointing exit for them losing um, in the what, quarterfinals to France. Um, Barrett, uh, I think, has a lot of hype to him like Emmanuel quickly did. And if you look at the splits between his Knicks days and his Raptors days last year, 26 games with the Knicks, um, shot 42% from the field, 33% from three, 83% um, from the line, 18 points per game. Um, and the Knicks were like, we can get Ananobi. We weren't going to pay Emmanuel quickly all this money because we're paying Brunson and Randall and all these other guys. Um, he goes and plays 32 games in Toronto, 55% from the field, 12% increase, 39% from three, 6% increase. Um, and what I liked about that, I feel like he was taking better shots. He wasn't trying to force anything, something that he really wasn't now. I don't know what happened to his free throws, but his free throws dropped off. Um, and then he averaged 22 points per game. Now, the Raptors were not a good team. They weren't. They were kind of tanking. They had injuries. Um, they were running out some bad lineups come March time. So I would like for RJ to prove that he's a winning player. And I do think he's shown that in New York. Um, him and Emmanuel quickly, I think are going to be winning guys out there with Scotty Barnes. And I do think he's going to take that momentum from his second half stint with the Raptors, with Team Canada into his first full year as a Raptor for his hometown team. And I think he's going to be really good next year and really efficient. Coming in at number 12, it is Jalen Green. I mean, it's now or never for Jalen Green. He's just somebody... Oh, man, that is just like has all the potential in the world, all the tools. He was taken second overall by the Houston Rockets in the 2021 NBA draft, and he is just still such a head case as a player. There's games where he's looking like prime Michael Jordan out there, and then there's games where it's like I can't even have him on the floor because he's going to be a liability defensively. He's not getting his teammates involved. He's taking horrible shots. The splits are ridiculous for what he was. I mean, like... He was bad for three quarters of the year. He was bad in October. He was bad in November. Um, a little better, but I mean, not what you want to be in November. He was terrible in December. He was not good in January. He was horrible in February. But what? I don't know what happened in March. I don't know if he got more sleep. He was on a better diet. But he was somebody that could be a top five shooting guard in this league in March. 27.7 points per game, six rebounds, four assists, shot 49% from the field and 41% from three. Had the best defensive rating of the season basically in that month as well. So I don't know what he can do to make March of last year go throughout the full year. Because if we don't see that, then I mean like I don't need 27 points a game from Jalen Green. I would like 22 on good efficiency, locking in on the defensive end of the floor and giving me four assists tonight. I am cool with that. He also averaged six rebounds. Like 
I want to see him crash the glass. I want to see him hustle out there. But if he can tap into what he was in March, if he can tap into 90% of that throughout 80 games this year, I may have him low at 12. But if he doesn't, I may have him way too high. Coming in at number 11, I think is due for another big year. And that is Jalen Suggs of the Orlando Magic. Now, I was talking about Colin Sexton before. I think doing a great job finding his role in the NBA. And Jalen Suggs, like top player in high school in Minnesota, um, goes to Gonzaga. We think he's going to be like this point guard. He's, we think he's going to be um, like Cade Cunningham him asking 2021 and he just wasn't that in the nba i feel like the playmaking wasn't great in his first two years there were defensive flashes but he was not a good shooter whatsoever but last year he kind of realized that you know what i'm not going to be this elite initiating point guard i'm going to be one of the best 3D players in this league. Someone that's going to shoot 47% from the field, 40% from three on five attempts a night. I'm going to be a good free throw shooter. I'm going to get my assist. I'm not going to be anything crazy, but I'm also going to get my steals, my blocks, play all defensive caliber defense and be a winning player. And that's what I love in Jalen Suggs. And I think he's improved so much from the first two years in this league, especially since his rookie year where I think a lot of people were down on him and he really came back and broke out last year and I think he's going to take that over to this year now he could be a point guard I mean I have no idea who's running the point for this team is it going to be black uh, I guess with KCP and maybe Suggs at the one I don't know how I feel about Suggs as a lead initiator because then I'm a little bit worried he could take a step back um, maybe it's going to be Paolo as the lead initiator Maybe it's going to be Cole Anthony. I don't know, um, but I, I like Suggs in this more uh, of an off-ball role rather than the point guard. Coming in at number 10, I have Malik Monk of the Sacramento Kings. Now, Malik Monk, I think, should have won six man of the year. I did have him over Nas Reed. Uh, he was really good in 72 games last year for the Sacramento Kings. He did get hurt towards the end of the year. He averaged 15 and a half points, five assists. I, I think uh, you go back to guys that have improved so much since the early days. I mean, Monk was a flamethrower at Kentucky, just was inefficient. I think very consistent at times. For the Charlotte Hornets on relatively bad teams uh, when he got drafted. And then he really turned his career around, I think, towards the end of the Charlotte days, but was so hit or miss as the three point shooter. I'm surprised after the 21 season, Charlotte didn't want to bring him back. Um, and then he kind of turned his career around completely in LA uh, and then has been really good, arguably the best player off the bench in the last two years for Sacramento. Um, yeah, he's maybe like the only non starter here in the top 15, um, but he is perfect in the six man role. And maybe that's something like, like I mentioned before, like Jordan, Clark Jordan Clarkson could excel at. Guys like, Maybe it's Anthony Simons or Cam Thomas. One day for a good team could excel out because that's what we're seeing Malik Monk do for a good team in the Western Conference. All right, let's kick off the top nine here. I do have Tower Hero of the Miami Heat. I think people dislike Tower Hero, and I get why for sure. I mean, he's someone that I think is a little too cocky out there, thinks of something he's not. But he is someone that is still a very good basketball player. And I know the Heat have dangled him in Willard talks before and other top guys on the market. And Hero is somebody that... I don't know could be a number one or number two option we saw him that uh with that role against the celtics in round number one and he was abysmal he looked lost out there was taking horrible shots turning the ball over but i think yeah i mean he won six minute of the year in 2022 i mean the heat i think are going to need to start him next year um he was banged up last year he was banged up in the playoffs in 2023 but he's someone that's going to be i think a consistent 20 point score a night he's going to be efficient he's going to get to his spots he's going to do it i think with easy is a nice mid-range jumper and i just kind of like his game a little bit more than malik monks right now and that's why he's coming in at number nine coming in at number eight he broke out in the playoffs last year for the indiana pacers he was good for team canada and that is andrew nemhard andrew nemhard was a fine player throughout the regular season um he played a little bit of point guard i think the pacers realized how good he was as more of a starting shooting guard i mean mather and going down helped that out a ton but in his first career playoff run he was great, man. He really was. 13 points, excuse me, 14 points, three rebounds, five assists against the Bucks in round number one, 60% from the field, 45% from three, carries the momentum in round number two against the Knicks, 12 points, three rebounds, five assists, hit a massive game winner in game three, 55% from the field, 53% from three. I feel like he wasn't missing. He is a great mid-range jumper as well. He has such a good touch around the rim. And then against the Celtics, 21 points, four rebounds, eight assists in 35 minutes, shot 54% from the field, 48% from three, 89% from the line. Man, Andrew Nemo could be really good next year. I am going to have him. I think I'm debating between him or Emmanuel quickly as my most improved player. Um, I may go to quickly just because Nemhard, like there's so many mouths to feed in Indiana and with Matherin back. Um, Walker may have a bigger role. Like I don't know if he's going to get those opportunities that we saw in the playoffs, but in the playoffs, I want him more than almost everybody else that we talked about. Coming in at number seven, we have another Memphis Grizzlies, somebody that was banged up last year, like that whole team, and that is Desmond Bain. Desmond Bain appeared in 42 games last year. He averaged 24 points, four 
four and a half rebounds and five and a half assists. I do expect those numbers to go down next year when everybody else is healthy and you have John Morant back. But Desmond Bain is as elite of a shooter as you can get. 42% three-point shooter in his first four years. He shot over 40% in his first three years in the league and then 38% from three on eight and a half attempts per night last year. He's a really elite secondary scorer in this league. I think he could be a number... I don't know about a number two on a championship team, maybe a number three. I mean, we haven't talked about anybody that I think could be a number two on a championship team yet. Maybe the closest guy at their peak would be Jalen Green. I don't even know if that could be RJ Barrett or Simons or Cam Thomas, um, or even probably not Hero. So I think Bain has the best shot at being that. I think I think my number six guy could be a number two on a really good team. Um, it's just he's overpaid. Um, and then the top three are clearly number ones. And I think number four is a number two as well. Uh, so I think I think Desmond Bain and my number six guy would be number threes. Good number threes. But that's what I want. And Bain is going to do it at an efficient level. So coming in at number six, uh, you could disagree with this. Uh, the reason why I still think he's a good player, um, or the reason why you may think this is too high is because he's overpaid. It's Zach Levine. Zach Levine is making way too much money for what his production has been. Uh, he's had trouble staying healthy in his career career but basically he was healthy in 22 and 23 at a good rate and he was phenomenal in those two years he was really efficient I thought he was a winning player and he was a great number two to DeMar DeRozan I thought him and Lonzo were perfect in a backcourt together because Lonzo could facilitate for him and help him out on the defensive end of the floor uh, I don't know if we're going to see that in Chicago and Levine may be a small forward at the end of the year because this is the third bowl that I've talked about um, but over those two years from the 22 season and the 23 season 24 and a half points four and a half rebounds four and a half assists um, uh, shooting 48% from the field, 38% from three, 85% from the line. I think he gets to the rim well. Uh, he is going to be inconsistent, but he was an all-star um, in 21 and in 22. And I know he was banged up last year. He wasn't good, really, in the 25 games he played in. I hope we see Levine have a bounce back year, and I could see that. Um, and the reason why you may not have him high is because he's overpaid, and that's fine. He's not the best value out of everybody here, but I do think he's a top six shooting guard. Coming in at number five, I called him the LeBron James of role players. I don't even know if we can consider him a role player anymore, and that is Derek White of the Boston Celtics. He's playing for Team USA. He's literally a perfect complimentary piece to the Jays over there in Boston. He was the primary, uh, primary, yeah, primary shooting guard last year for the Celtics. Appeared 76 uh, percent of his minutes at the shooting guard position, um, and he's just stepped up in the playoffs uh, for the Celtics. Like he was phenomenal um, a couple years ago, or it was last year against the Miami Heat. Um, no, excuse, sorry, that, that was this year against the Miami Heat in round number one. He obviously had that game winner that put back against the Heat in what was like game five or six, and the conference finals two years ago um he put up great numbers against the heat in round number one i think took a little bit of a step back against cleveland um but was solid against the pacers um and was fine against the um against the Mavericks in the finals, but he's someone that's going to do everything. He's going to still be able to put up 20 points per game if he wanted to. He's going to be an elite three-point shooter, an elite defender, an elite passer, an elite rebounder. Um, I love almost every aspect of Derek White's game. Um, I think maybe the playmaking could be a little bit better, but I think he's actually still great on that end of the floor. I mean, you're talking about shooting guards. Like, what other shooting guards are better playmakers than Derek White that we've talked about so far? Maybe Malik Monk's one. At his peak, it could be Jalen Green, too. That that could be it. Maybe Josh Kitty is just an initiator three. Pozemski, four. Shepard and Ivy. I don't even know, man. No, Derek White's better than most of the league, or probably all those guys as a playmaker. Um, and he's coming in at number five. And I, I I couldn't put him any higher because of his ceiling as an offensive player. I mean, he, if he was your number one scoring option, you'd probably be picking number one overall in the NBA draft. Um, but if he's your number two or number three, you could be competing for an NBA title. Uh, coming in at number four, it is like he's now a shooting guard. It's Kyrie Irving. Kyrie Irving um, was a point guard in Cleveland. And now since he's playing with Luka Doncic, he is a shooting guard. So I'm going to rank him as a shooting guard. Um, I would like Kyrie to be not as passive as he was in the playoffs last year. Uh, the last yeah two years, basically, he's been a shooting guard ever since he got traded to the Dallas Mavericks. Um, and yeah, he's someone that was elite last year. If you round up, he was a 54. 40 90 shooter 50 from the field percent from the field 40 percent from three 90 percent from the line 25 and a half points five and a half assists five rebounds also another elite playmaker and literally as good as a number two option as you can get in this league probably the best number two option in this league i mean you probably have in the tier one of number two options it's like ad jalen brown kyrie irving maybe it's like maxi slash paul george <laughs> like he's in that tier one of guys that you could talk about. I'm sure there's somebody I'm missing, so I apologize. Uh, that was just off the top of my head. Dame, obviously. Um, but yeah, Kyrie's as good as it gets. Um, I don't think you could put him any higher. I don't think he's in the tier one, the top three guys. But he, I think, is in this tier uh, by himself. He's a tier above Derek White. So coming in at number three, uh, these guys could all be, I think, one or two and three. Uh, it's Devin Booker coming in at number three. I thought Devin Booker did a great job last year as a playmaker. 27 points, four and a half rebounds, seven assists. He was a point guard last year. 
Now that they got Ty Jones, I think he's going to be more of a shooting guard, can develop more on his offensive game, even though he was elite offensively last year. Um, and I thought stepped up um, at times against the Timberwolves in their playoff exit. He wasn't the reason they lost, but he was phenomenal against the, was it the Nuggets? Yeah, it was the Nuggets two years ago. He doesn't really show up at, time, uh, at times in elimination games, but he's been really good throughout the course of his career in the playoffs, besides maybe the conference finals against uh, the Clippers a couple years ago. But hey, they won that series. Uh, but yeah, last year, uh, he ended up playing 91% of his minutes at the point guard position. I do think he'll be more of a shooting guard this year, and he's a top three one. If you have him at one or two, I'm okay with that. I think... These guys, one, two, and three, are so close to each other. Coming in at number two, it's Donovan Mitchell. Uh, Donovan Mitchell kept the Cavs alive and as one of the best teams in the NBA when Garland and Mobley were out. He only appeared in 55 games last year, put up 26 and a half points, five rebounds, and six assists a night. It's pretty much what guy do you think you can rely on more in the playoffs? Um, I think... I mean, it could go either way who you prefer more. I mean, Donovan Mitchell's had his playoff moments, but he's also had his disappointing playoff exits. Uh, and he's someone that I think you can rely on as much as anybody else here. Uh, there's going to be some inefficient games. I mean, his last playoff series for Utah was really bad against Dallas. But ever since coming to Cleveland, I mean, he's been back and forth for sure. But he was, I don't know, I, I think really good this year in the playoffs. And I think we're going to see a new Donovan Mitchell unlocked. And I think we go back and forth every year between Mitchell and Booker. And I like Mitchell more on the defensive end of the floor, but it's not like he's that much better than Booker. And coming in at number one, having all the momentum from last year, uh, beating Devin Booker in the playoffs, uh, beating uh, Nikola Jokic in the playoffs, advancing to the Western Conference Finals, playing for Team USA. He's been up and down, but he's been a good player for Team USA, and that's Anthony Edwards. Oh, the Ant-Man. In year number four, I have him as the best shooting guard, or I'll be going into year five. I have him as the best shooting guard in the NBA. 46% from the field, 36% from three, 84% from the line. Maybe not as efficient as Devin Booker is, um, or as consistent as Donovan Mitchell is, but I think he's someone that, when it matters the most, best defender out of the three, and he's going to take over games when they matter the most, like I said. I mean, he's playing on a good Timberwolves team, but he went off against the... Um, against the Nuggets in 23, carried the momentum, went off against the Suns in round one this year, uh, played good against Denver, was inconsistent. Uh, the game seven stinker, yeah, offensively, but he's going to impact the games other ways. He averaged eight assists against the Dallas Mavericks in round three. I think Edwards is going to develop that style of play as well as a playmaker, maybe like Devin Booker has throughout the course of his career. So I have Anthony Edwards one. It kind of changes every year, but Edwards is a little bit younger. He's by far the number one option. I mean, uh, as the number two scoring option, yeah, you have Cat there, but in, in Phoenix, it's Kevin Durant and Devin Booker. In Cleveland, it is Mitchell one, but then you have to give the rock in, to Garland and, and Mobley and Allen. So I think Edwards is going to put up, I think, the most points per game out of the three. I mean, it could be Booker. I don't know. He put up the least out of three next, last year, but I think he could put up the most out of them this year. He could win the scoring title. He has the potential to do so, and he's coming in as my number one shooting guard. So if you guys did enjoy my top 30 shooting guards ranking, if you did on YouTube, I'd appreciate it if you dropped the thumbs up. Let me know in the comments what you think. If you guys are listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, we would appreciate a rating and review over there as well. Love you guys, and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.